the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. They're looking for things that do continue to make sense because they are real and basic in the context of things just getting crazy. Please don't ignore some of the quote-unquote masters of the universe and in the fact that the world is getting topsy-turvy, but there are still some very clear-headed things that can be done. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. David, honestly, I get so bored with politics. I hope that this program never becomes like a lot of the political programs that are on the radio. Not that there's anything wrong, but if you need three hours of your side cheering for your side, that's where you go. If we're here... We can make political comments, and I'll tell you, I watched the debates the other night, and I realize at this point, Trump may not need Powell to lower rates after all to get reelected. I I think the Democrats, the way they bicker with each other right now, they're going to do it for him. I know. You've got Trump who is wanting in the U.S. to have the equivalent of a Mario Draghi, the head of the European Central Bank, that type of person at the helm of the Federal Reserve, so he can kind of lock in his re-election bid. And I understand that. But Powell, you know, he's not a guarantor of, of, of either Trump's victory or defeat. You're right. When you judge the Democratic debates this last week, you get the <laughs> myriad of candidates. They're all competing for the Oval Office. They're competing with each other for various versions of shakedown socialism. How can we give everything away for free and still get elected? I think they may do more for Trump's campaign than easy money policies can. So one headline which read, Democrats split on how far left to nudge nation. Right. Uh, You know, and and this is a comment from our friend Bill King. He pointed out that a vote for Trump is really a vote for a firewall against extreme socialism. Mm. So, you know, back to our conversation with Pippa Malmgren, she drew the distinction between sort of freshwater and and, and saltwater types. And the freshwater Americans are your non-coastal states. I think those in those areas who voted for Trump and may vote for Trump in the next election aren't doing so. It's not that they're voting for Trump as much as they're voting against the perpetuation of an anti-state right. bent on redistributing assets. And that's what you had on display with all these, you know, 20-odd people arguing for whose assets they can take and give to whom. Well, and, that's what I was going to say. Did you see Bernie Sanders? He says, what we're going to do is we're going to tax the middle class. Yes. Oh, now, that's, that's wise. <laughs> yeah. They asked Biden what he would do, what would be his first agenda item uh, when as, as elected president. president. And he said, defeat Trump. Yeah, there's a guy who's really... <laughs> (laughs) connected. (laughs) And so it's not a surprise that you've got Trump's odds of re-election. They went from 45 percent on Friday prior to the debates and Saturday morning they're at 52 percent. So the day after his odds are increasing and all it is that's improving his odds of winning the White House again are the Democrats blathering back and forth against each other. Well, if Trump was wise, what he would do is he would actually sponsor some of these and get these on. I mean, the more Democratic (laughs) debates, the better. But, you know, okay. so going back, we were talking about Federal Reserve presidents and You know, Mario Draghi in 2011, we've talked about uh, before he came out and he said, we'll do whatever it takes. Well, obviously, that meant we will buy everything out there, uh, bad, good, whatever. But, you know, here in America, Dallas Fed President uh, Robert Kaplan, this sounds understated when you listen to this program and you hear what he has to say. But he actually was making sense. He says, you know, we may be contributing to a buildup of excesses and imbalances in the economy at this point if we cut rates. Occasionally, you see some uh, reason thinking come into the conversation with your various Fed presidents. And this one I thought was was very good, a paper that he wrote. And Kaplan, you know, again, the paper that he published was basically asking the question, stimulus at this juncture, isn't it going to contribute to a buildup of excesses and imbalances in the economy? The answer is yes. And he suggests that if we continue to, to build those excesses and imbalances, they will become difficult and painful to manage. So again, it's just moment of sobriety, you know, what some would interpret as kind of a hawkish statement, but it's just asking the question, can you do this forever? Whereas the doves would say, no, you got to be loose. You got to be accommodative. You got to make sure we never get in a tough spot. Okay. But let's look at excess. Just a month ago, we said the old saying is sell in 
May. Sell in May and go away on the stock market. I guess those excesses actually changed that statement. Fox Business pointed out that the Dow had its best June in 81 years. Mm. And the S&P 500 had its best June in 64 years. So, yeah, the idea of sell in May and go away, while there's wisdom attached to it, it's generally helpful and not this year. Instead, we've got a low volume rally in price, which can be pretty dangerous if you're right. talking about coming into the summer months and, and a pretty radical increase in price, but not on, on strong volume. Low volume rally in price, it's aided by your super low interest rate structure. Ours are reasonably accommodative. And if you're looking globally, you know, it's accelerating things like the issuance of junk bonds. Yeah. And yeah, definitely- but the other bond market is it's singing a different tune. Yeah, and, and, and it's it's also feeding the appetite for investment grade bonds, which are, you know, obviously a bigger income stream, the investment grade bonds relative to your sovereign debt markets. But again, if you're talking about a, a lower structure of interest rates globally, it's feeding imbalances. It's feeding a misdirection of capital. Sovereign debt from across Europe and the move into sovereign debt by your central bank community, it's reshaping the fixed income landscape. Well, sure, because $13 trillion now is yielding negative returns. When you have a central banking community that buys all the bonds, they don't have to offer. The bonds don't have to offer interest. I was on a portfolio manager meeting or a call uh, this last week, and I mentioned $11.6 trillion in negative yielding bonds. And Doug was kind, but had a little bit of a scolding tone in his voice and said, <laughs> Dave, that was several weeks ago. It's at 13 presently. And I said, okay, 13. I'm wrong. It wasn't $11.6 trillion. Uh, but yeah, when, when you have sovereign debt from across Europe reshaping the fixed income landscape, what happens is it makes things here in the U.S. look downright generous by comparison. So, you know, not only do we have positive nominal yields, but our 10 years is still of 2%, which Mm. relative to, and we'll get into this uh, a little bit later, but relative to the rest of the world, I mean, we've got pretty juicy yields. Mm. And, you know, but again, in a low rate environment, we mentioned access for junk borrowers. You've got a lot of new issuance from junk uh, borrowers, folks that need to raise capital and do it at, at a higher interest rate. But it's also worth reflecting on what this low interest rate structure has done to accelerate and enhance and underscore the IPO environment. Well, do you remember, okay, the late 90s when we had, you could pull anything up and do an IPO and whoever was on the IPO, whoever could invest in it beforehand, they'd get rich as long as they sold within a couple of hours. IPOs are an amazing way to just hand your friends your money uh, initially and what we're seeing now is the same type of environment. Just bring something out for initial public offering. Yeah, year to date, you've got the best IPO environment uh, that then you've had in, in the last five years. There's Baker McKenzie, who have showed a, a total of 62 IPOs so far this year, raising $25 billion. And actually, that's just in the second quarter. That's not year to date. That's uh, 62 IPOs in the, the second quarter, raising $25 billion, which is a pretty good pace. Okay, so those are some of the imbalances that Maybe they were talking about, you know, maybe that uh, Kaplan was talking about. But what bothers me, Dave, we've talked before about this passive investing environment where a person doesn't actually go buy the investment anymore. They just put it into an ETF or, you know, they put it into something where they can say, all right, well, I'm not going to go buy bonds themselves. I'll just buy an ETF that buys bonds. The problem is they're assuming liquidity when they want to get out. And Mark Carney has been particularly critical of this at the head of the Bank of England looking at the structural problem where where funds are flowing into products that don't have the implied liquidity. They don't actually have liquidity that the structure implies. So your modern day conservative investor is seeking the comfort today of a larger bond allocation. A lot of that via ETFs and, and the structure of those products is mismatched with the nature of how bonds trade. And again, what you have is the implied liquidity in a basket of assets. That's not consistent with the relatively illiquid nature of bonds. There's a fresh record high here in the last uh, week that ETF bond funds have seen continued inflows. Year to date, $72 billion, mm. new all-time highs, $741 billion into those products in total. And those products have only ever been tested in an environment of long-term secular downtrend in rates. Yeah, so, 35 years of 
downtrend in rates. You don't have mass bond exodus when people are continually seeing the rates go down because they're they're holding those bonds at higher, higher rates. What happens when interest rates reverse? They're going to be people who actually want to get out of those bonds. What if they all want out at the same time? Yeah, and, and this is where, you know, selling by appointment is not a concept that an ETF investor is used to, but sometimes mm. it's not the click of a mouse. You have to schedule it in order to liquidate, and you may not get the best bid. And so there are dynamics well, that are mutual funds are also like that, are they not? Right. Well, Bloomberg points to mutual funds, and this is a staggering figure, but what has evolved, maybe arguably devolved over the last 10, 11, 12 years is, is that mutual funds are holding more and more corporate bonds on their balance sheets. So it used to be that dealers would keep an inventory. And we've talked about how that's changed dramatically. If you go back to our conversation with Richard Bookstaber, he would say, we changed the incentive structure mm-hmm. for the folks who would have inventoried stocks and bonds. And there's not as much incentive to be a market maker today. Well, you penalize the middleman. The market maker in the, in the bond market is called a dealer. And, and, and dealers today hold a lot less in corporate bond inventory. In fact, mutual funds now have 43 times more corporate bonds on their balance sheets than dealers do, compared to just two times back in 2007. So, you know, part of it is the dealers holding less and a part of it is the mutual funds holding more. But we're back to that same issue of a mismatch of the structure and the items that are going into the structure. The structure implies liquidity, but the items going in don't have inherent liquidity. And this this was fascinating. And so what you're saying is Mark Carney, the president of the Bank of England, is basically at this point saying, hey, there might be a problem here, guys. We're seeing these markets buy up an awful lot of illiquid assets at times, at times illiquid. What if, what if somebody wants to sell this in in large order? When, and frankly, it's not just a hypothetical for him because in recent weeks, a flag's been raised over a particular fund. And this is, in my mind, kind of the supreme irony of the second quarter. As we close out the second quarter, go into the second half of the year, Mark Carney from the Bank of England is chastising this fund for holding illiquid assets, but allowing for unlimited withdrawals. Hmm. So the the assets inside can't be sold at a moment's notice, and yet the structure of the fund says that you can sell as much as you want and get as much liquidity as you need in an instant, and it's just not reasonable. So he says that this fund in particular is problematic, but that the risks like it are in fact systemic. So you've got $30 trillion, he points out, now tied up in difficult to trade instruments. Hmm. 30 trillion with a T. (laughs) That was not million, that was not billion, that was trillion with a T. And yes, if you, the listener, can't wrap your mind around one trillion, neither can I, Five trillion, thirty trillion. It's a, just a big number. Mm-hmm. But well, I, each time you, you you times it by a thousand. Okay, so a million times a thousand is a billion times th- a thousand is a trillion. And this is thirty of those. So yeah, it, Mark says that there's a lot of that money in mutual funds and exchange traded products owned by mom and pop investors. It's raising questions of who's responsible for keeping investors safe from having liquidity dry up at just the wrong time. Yes. Now, and again, this is why I call it the supreme irony of the second quarter, guess what the name of the fund was investing in high yield bonds that are at present illiquid? Uh, I don't know. H2, H2O Doomed? asset management. <laughs> oh, H2O asset management. H- oh my gosh. Having liquidity problems, are we? You know, the part of art is irony. But this is beyond irony. Was, That's ridiculous. I know. It's funny. So you've got the attractiveness of lower quality credit and the attractiveness of that credit is being defined by the relative relationship to government bonds, government issued paper. And, you know, so this is where the ECB is, is very significant. The ECB and other central banks as well, buying government paper, what it does is you get individual investors squeezed. They're squeezed out of safer income streams. They're forced to look at less safe income streams and to get their income needs met sure. elsewhere. It's, it's a crowding out effect. Or if you want to think of it as a knock on effect, I think it's a very profound one. It's a central bank making a policy choice which alters investment behavior Hmm. and the net result of central banks stepping in as the artificial source of demand in the bond market is a much riskier environment altogether with an underappreciation for the risks being taken by, as Mark Carney called them, the mom and pop investors. And I think he rightfully points out, so who's responsible for keeping them safe? 
Well, I mean, ultimately, I think we know where this ends. Massive bailouts, even more money printing. As Doug Nolan suggested, having our central bank go from a $4 trillion balance sheet to a $10 trillion balance sheet, there will be no surprise when that happens. And by the way, there'll be some sort of mirrored response by the ECB, the BOJ, et cetera, et cetera. Save your vol. Night on a white horse for anyone in distress. Today's modern central banks. I think we should look, you know, using a metaphor at the last 10 years, especially the last, say, eight years when, you know, interest rates continued to drop. And then by 2015, they went to negative rates. It's a little bit like being at a market. Let's say that you're retired and you have savings. You need someone to loan to who will pay you interest so that you can get some income. And then the giant steps in, the European Central Bank or the Federal Reserve or you name it, the Bank of Japan, the People's Bank of China, they step up to the same market device and they say, you don't have to pay interest. We're just going to buy them anyway. We're going to buy those bonds. Well, here you are. You're a retired person. You need, the interest. you need interest. You need to be able to loan it to somebody. What happens is you end up having to go to the ghetto bonds with the guys who you absolutely know in the end are not good for it. You have to loan them the money so that you can eke out just a little bit of an interest rate. I mean, this is a crime, Dave. What you're doing is you are squeezing. You you said it yourself. These people are being squeezed out of the income that they could have from a relatively safe investment by investors like these central banks that can just print money and do it as long as they'd like because they can make more. Repression is redistribution. That's what it is. Repression of interest rates, repression within the financial markets is redistribution. It's the saver, it's the person in the middle class living on a fixed income that is having a revenue stream which would have been theirs go to subsidizing a larger stock of debtors. And they're going to have a hard time selling even the ghetto bonds. When the time comes, I like the way that that's you've described that because high yield, you know, is a euphemism for junk bonds and junk speaks to kind of the quality of it. And you could say, well, one man's trash is another man's treasure. But calling them a ghetto bond, <laughs> it kind of <it> <laughs> creates a visual. You go, yeah, it's, it's a little rough. Yeah, it's a little rough. You know, I mean, the fact that ETFs and mutual funds are the vehicles seeing massive inflows is extra disturbing because it reinforces a financial market design flaw. This is really the point here. You've got well-functioning, robust financial markets in one environment, and they become extra dysfunctional when the flows of capital move in reverse. Again, so as long as you've got a buyer's appetite, these vehicles work well. But when sellers become dominant in the marketplace, mm -hmm. this is where the dysfunction and the capital in reverse reveal the weaknesses in the structures. So, Carney, this is what Carney's addressing. That's his point. point. 30, tri 30 trillion. $30 trillion in capital, which works functionally under the best of circumstances, doesn't behave as well under the less than ideal circumstances. This is kind of what we have in the making. We continue to add to misallocation of capital and pretend as if capital only flows one direction. Well, anyone who's been around more than a day on Wall Street knows that that's not the case. Okay, so we're hitting 81-year records for June in stock market. Okay, so equities melting up, basically, at the same time that the bond market, there's a lot of money going into the bond market right now. So you have these two things going on at once. We've seen this before. Yeah, and as we talked about last week, there's multiple people, multiple audiences, if you will, or buyers coming into the bond market. The part that's the most interesting, the segment that's the most interesting to us is the segment that's seeking the safe haven yeah. aspects of particular bonds. Not all bonds, but particular bonds. Does this smack of 2007 to you? In some respects, you're right. We've been here before. Back in 2007, the world watched in amazement as our financial markets were melting up. And the bond market at that point was less enthusiastic. And it was signaling that maybe you needed to move to higher ground. Maybe you need to consider safer territory. Maybe you needed to take some risk out of the equation. Again, that was the bond investor while the stock market was partying like it was 1999. S&P was motoring higher. Sophisticated market operators were moving out of high risk areas. And you were seeing rate compression. Again, so the value of a bond is going up as people are buying it. And rates, the interest that you receive on that bond, are coming down as an indication of strong demand for that asset. That was in full swing as investors were trafficking into bonds. And again, it's kind of what we have today. Okay, but haven't we been talking about credit expanding dramatically? Wouldn't you think interest rates would be needing to rise as more and more people are seeking credit? 
Well, it's difficult to see interest rates rise in an environment where you've got an artificial buyer. And, you know, as, as uh, Doug Nolan asks this last week in the Credit Bubble Bulletin, why were yields collapsing in the face of booming credit growth hmm. and inflating risk markets? Because the preservation of terminal phase excess was fomenting a late cycle parabolic rise in systemic risk. You've got inflating quantities of increasingly risky credit instruments. You've got dysfunctional risk intermediation, destabilizing market speculation, and extreme late cycle imbalances. So in other words, the bond market was discerning an increasingly untenable situation. You've been talking about bond vigilantes. The bond market is a little bit more of a signaling device than, say, the equities market is. Are we seeing a signal? Yeah, well, I mean, as we discussed last week, the signaling function of rates with yields, higher yields, and sort of widening credit spreads indicating stress. And that is an important dynamic to remember. There's also the indication of traffic, a different kind of signal, an indication of traffic into perceived safe havens, mm-hmm. which marks lower rates and higher prices as you see demand increase for safe havens, right? So that's the signaling function we have today. Investor enthusiasm for stocks is running in parallel with safe haven buying of bonds. And it's in a fairly incongruous message that the market is operating today, so and communicating today. And, And I think if past experience offers any wisdom, the bond buyer and the price action in bonds today is offering up a pretty bad omen. Okay. So in a way, if you had to picture it, it's like a bunch of people are running onto the Titanic. At the same time, there is a whole different group of people who are lowering the lifeboats and getting off. Yeah. And and, and I like (laughs) the the beauty of that analogy is that the people who are clamoring onto the boat, they're fascinated with all the new whiz bang gidgets. They're listening to the music and drinking the wine. It's, it's, (laughs) it's It's a luxury cruise and everybody's got the money to enjoy it. The people getting into the Lifeboats are the boat operators, right? Which should suggest something to you. You've got the non-sophisticated, therefore, kind of the appeal of, isn't this great? I'm just loving the experience. While the operators are saying... (laughs) Well, look at the central uh, banks. The central banks last year bought seventy over 70% more gold than they did the year before. They're part of the operators, but also there are big name investors who we've seen in the past have a tendency to know ahead of time the signals. And some of those big name investors right now are showing up in gold. Well, and they have been actually for a couple of months. Last week was very interesting because you saw an allocation to gold in smaller numbers Call it the investor class, the street level investor class here in the United States, a billion dollars of inflows into GLD last week. Hmm. And that's the smaller investor. I think so. And it, but at the same time, you have had, as you mentioned, the chorus of hedge fund guys interested in gold. And that number that the members of the chorus, so to say, is growing. You've got Jeff Gundlach and Kyle Bass and Ray Dalio and Stanley Druckenmiller, a few notable names, interested in gold as one of the best trades of 2019. Interested, even though we now know again and again and again that gold is a manipulated price asset. OK, I mean, when you can trade hundreds and hundreds of times the amount of actual physical metal on paper. Uh, I mean, look at Merrill Lynch. You can naked short the market anytime you want. You pay millions in fines when you get your hand slapped and you make billions in profits. And I think this is the message you're talking about the DOJ prosecution here, DOJ prosecution of Merrill Lynch for manipulating precious metals prices. Bad boys. Bad boys. And, and it's, Stop and doing that. It wasn't like once and they caught them, but they were being scolded for having done this thousands of times over a seven-year period. And in the recent days, Merrill agrees to pay $25 million, million with an M, M, million in fines connected <laughs> to deceptive trading practices, spoofing and things like that. So the time period in question, 2008 to 2014, lots of downside volatility in the metals market as you got into the 2013 and 14 period, lots of upside market movement in the 2009 to 11 period. Right. So there are thousands of what the DOJ called fraudulent orders which they're being held responsible for. And you know, it brings to mind, well, who else trades the metals in these markets? Who else has mastered creating false impressions of supply and demand? And where else is the manipulation of price a common effort? Mm. And it, it, th- this is where, again, your point 
well taken. Twenty-five million is a pittance. On that basis, <laughs> yeah. you've just told the investment community that the commodities pits is the place to play games of price manipulation because profits are in the billions, fines are in the millions. That is, by definition, a regulatory and market arbitrage. You know, you told me when you were traveling in South America, one of the smaller countries in South America, you actually had to keep cash with you because when the cops pull you over, it's just assumed you're going to get pulled over, first of all. And <laughs> it's also assumed you're going to pay them off so that you can keep going down the highway. It's almost like a toll. Don't you think, in a way, this fine, $25 million, they make that on a single trade, okay? This is a toll booth is really what it is. I don't know if I, did I ever tell you the story about getting pulled over in Paraguay? Uh, yeah, I didn't want to name the country, okay, but well, yeah, you named it. So okay. so I'm, I'm there in Paraguay with a good friend and we get pulled over and, and I... I don't think I was speeding, but, you know, I start talking to this guy and, and he says, well, here's the ticket and these are big implications and I can't believe you were doing this. And if you'll just provide, I don't remember, I think it was $500, mm. you know, we, we can make this go away. I was like, $500 US, <laughs> not a chance. Right. I wasn't speeding. Right. So we go into this debate. I'm debating with a guy. Who knows? I mean, he could drag me out into the weeds and shoot me in the back of the head. I'm sure Mary Catherine was really happy that you were debating with a cop in Paraguay. But she wasn't with me. She yeah. wasn't with me. It was it was a fascinating conversation. I had a satellite phone that was not working, and I pulled out a business card that I had of, of, a, of a local lawyer in town who was very well connected with some of the local judges. Hmm. And I said, let me just let me just get a friend on the phone. He needs to talk to you about this because what you're doing is illegal. And it was a Mexican, not a Mexican standoff. I'm sorry. It was a, it was a Paraguayan standoff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So is Merrill Lynch doing the same thing with the DOJ? Um, you know, again, I think what they've said is uh, this happens. It happens. We won't let it happen again. But for $25 million, of course, it's going to happen again. If they had said, you know, it's $500 million or it's a billion. I mean, it has to be a sizable enough number that people right. say it actually doesn't pay to play. In this case, it really does still pay to play the game of price manipulation. And they probably will. But, you know, we can't live in a bubble anymore. I mean, the world is so interconnected at this point. If you've got equities going up and bond yields going way down, which shows that there is a flight to safety, that may not even be a factor of something happening in this country. It may be something happening in another region of the world. Well, I've been, I've been brushing up a little on financial market history from the mid 19th century. And there's a, you know, series of crises that occurred. And it's fascinating as you look through the annals of financial history that there's just nothing's new. There's variations on a theme and the idea that it doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. There's enough similarities that you can learn from various circumstances and apply that to present and future circumstances. And, you know, you're reading Jim Grant's book before we get to. You're getting to pre-read a book that uh, I would love to read. So what are you learning? I've got an advanced reader copy of the biography of, of Walter Badgett, who's the first editor of The Economist magazine. Which was a conservative magazine back in the 1800s. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, what I find fascinating is the world then was kind of a, a slightly lesser developed, completely globalized world. So, you know, again, everything was on a smaller scale, lesser mm -hmm. developed phase of globalization than compared to now, but it was still powerfully interconnected. The financial system was powerfully interconnected. In the late 1840s, you get a tremendous amount of stress in the U.S. markets. And again, the signaling function, you've got interest rates in the United States, which vary. If you're funding a corporation, they varied from 18 to as high as 60%. Mm. I mean, so chaos. It's chaos and real stress, but that gets translated. It's quickly apparent in the London markets as well. Of course, so London, across the Atlantic, there was no telegraph at that time either, I don't think. And you get London dwarfing the U.S. at that stage in terms of size and scale, mm -hmm. but the lesser sized financial market disturbances in the U.S. led to British uh, in kind of the extreme interventions in the money markets and the impact in rates, uh, interest rates in a very powerful way. Things function differently, of course, during the gold standard period. And under the gold standard, central bank activism looked different. You still could be activist, but incredibly active in this case. Lending rates set by the Bank of England were raised from 5.5% to 11% over a 60-day period. 5.5 to 11. That's a radical shift. Mm. But what that was is to assuage panicky investors, to keep them 
interested in their pound sterling holdings and to prevent a mass exodus from gold within the banking system. Because anyone could come in and say, I want my deposits back. What, what were your deposits? Well, you could take them in the form of gold. And if you had too much gold leave the system, now you have a real issue. So the way that they induced people to, to stay in the system was to pay them more in interest. You know, in this case, five and a half went to six, six and a half went to eight, eight went to nine, nine went to 11% in a 60 day period. So, okay. So let's go back to the 1800s. Somebody sneezed in the United States and England caught a cold. In this particular case, China. We've been seeing what's been going on with the banking in China. Right. You mentioned last week the too big to fail in China. The big banks are getting the money right now, the bailout money. The little banks are liquidity starved. Yeah, and we're at a more advanced stage in globalization. In some respects, it's different. In some respects, it's even more interconnected today. Twitter diplomacy. Remember when you were talking to Jervis? I mean, it's instant. Right. So the credit markets in China, I think, do offer a parallel of that 19th century market bruising and perhaps even more so today, given the interlinkages. The interlinkages in the global financial system are very tight and the response times instantaneous. The primary takeaway, as I'm kind of reflecting back to, you know, the 1840s, late 1840s, is that we live in an interconnected world. What happens somewhere else matters. Mm -hmm. And what is happening in China at present is absolutely important for the U.S. and for the European financial markets. And the reality is the Lehman moment, the Lehman moment may already have occurred in China with the impact in European and U.S. markets, in fact, it may be in motion as we speak. If you remember Lehman, between the time that Lehman occurred and sort of the, the full-blown meltdown, you're talking about a 12 to 18 month period of time. But safe havens, you know, we talked about just a moment ago, it, they're catching the attention of astute investors the world over. Yeah. The equity party is continuing, even as you're seeing some sobriety in the making, that's making a comeback in other quarters of the, of the world. Well, what you're referring to, the Lehman moment, we actually had started the commentary by the time the Lehman moment occurred, if you recall. 2008, and, yep. Yep, 2008. And, but actually, the Lehman moment had started a year before with Bear Stearns coming out and trying to sell bonds. I remember, boy, I'll tell you, I called clients. I said, they just tried to sell $400 million, with an M. It was a small amount in bad bonds, okay, bad debt. And uh, they couldn't do it. So they immediately said, oops, never mind. We didn't mean that. They pulled it back off the market. But it sent a signal that at this point, these big firms are going to be in trouble. Now, Lehman was the one that was not bailed out. But we saw bailout after bailout after bailout going that way. And we're seeing this in China right now. China in May bailed out a massive institution. You know, and it is fascinating when you look at, you know, Bear and Lehman being at the receiving end of hardship when others were bailed out, shotgun wedding style perhaps, right. but you know, they still were accommodated in some way. Well, Lehman and Bear were firms that didn't pony up and participate in the old boys bailout club during the long-term capital management. So they're days. the ones that got punished. Yeah, absolutely. It was an internal market discipline. It was the old boys club saying, next time we call and we ask you to pony up, you pony up. Mm -hmm. Because this time we're not. And we don't care what happens to you. It's it just, I mean, I know is that anecdotal. happening in China right now? Well, I, what is happening in China is, is the Lehman moment in the sense that you've got the first bank to go. Baosheng Bank was taken over by the Chinese government in May. Earlier in the year, you had Anbang Insurance. So just months before that. But now it's Baosheng. And we mentioned the interventions of the PBOC, the People's Bank of China, last week to the tune of 45 billion U.S. Unfortunately, that liquidity is only circulating in the biggest of Chinese financial institutions. You've got the small banks and the non-bank financial firms, which are still liquidity starved. Baosheng has everyone in China thinking differently about risk okay. and credit quality. Nobody has packed up their brown box. They haven't packed their desk up. The government came in and took them over. That's right. So you're just talking about a tone change. And it's similar to Lehman in that prior to Baosheng, counterparty exposure was not a primary consideration. Now it is. Mm. Who's on the other side of a transaction is now very important. If liquidity is in the system, it's not going to certain people because now people are asking should they get it? Will we get it back? And it, again, it's just a tone change where counterparty exposure is a primary consideration today. Six months ago, it wouldn't have been. And I think that is a tone change like Lehman. And it's not just banks. 
It's trust companies. It's other types of institutions that are starting to fall off the cliff. Financial Times pointed out uh, a significant, it's a Shanghai listed trust, and it's pretty rare for them to default. And because the trust company was Shanghai listed, we've got a little bit more clarity as to what was going on, who they were lending to. We have some insight into what went wrong for the trust company. Suffice it to say, you've got lots of loans for real estate development in China. This is their subprime, right? You can think in those terms. And and, and these are real estate loans that were probably not economically viable from the start. So like Baosheng, I think what the trust company failure points to is a tone which is changing and a caution in lending. Again, more of a factor today than it was three to six months ago. What are the implications? Well, caution slows volumes and volumes dictate market pricing of assets. So that's, I think, an important thing. When you start to slow down this grand credit machine, there are implications because, again, caution slows the total volumes of transactions and the volumes of transaction dictate the market pricing of, of assets and the terms on which those those transactions occur. Well, going back six or seven months ago, you remember December was a dangerous period of time to be in the markets because it looked like we were having the downturn we're talking about. China came out in January and just went whoosh. They expanded credit. They just threw billions, tens of billions of dollars into the market. This expansion, you have these two things going on. You have the debt getting worse and worse and worse, but you have the expansion of the very debt we're talking about. Yeah, so major expansion of credit in China drives economic growth rates. That's the intention. Keep those high. Keep them focused on a six above number in terms of GDP growth. Maintain positive atmospheres. And here's where we begin to see cracks. We're seeing cracks in the structure of the financial markets, which suggests that other challenges lie ahead for Mm -hmm. them and for us and for us. So last week we discussed the cost to ship goods. We talked about the CAS. We talked about the Baltic dry, other various freight numbers, both international and then domestic trucking rates. We mentioned those as well. Again, it's just a further indication that financial market frailty is one dimension of concern. But you also have the global economic activity, which is also a real issue to watch. I think right now you need to watch it like a hawk. From this point of view, you've got Chinese imports falling rapidly. And you say, might say, well, yeah, that, that that's not a surprise. Look at we're in a, a trade and tariff war with China. So, you know, the import numbers from the U.S. are down 27 percent. What's surprising, and Bloomberg pointed this out, a drop of 16 percent in Japanese imports into China. 18%, a decline of 18% of imports from South Korea into China. And and again, slowing trade is more and more broad-based. So earlier today, we've talked about the financial structural issues, structural issues within the financial markets. The things we're talking about now reflect a slowing of the global economy. And it's apparent that it's not countries that are just caught in that trade and tariff debate. Add to that merger and acquisition activity here in the second quarter, actually in the U.S., pretty consistent with the IPO activity. So it's booming. Not bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fairly robust. I mean, so M&A activity is down a few percentage points quarter over quarter if you're talking U.S., whereas the IPOs are, you know, pretty robust. But the M&A merger activity, acquisition activity, European deal flow, that's down 54%. And Asian M&A is down 49%. So again, slowing trade, slowing deal flow. And you have to say this is becoming a global economic issue. Our guest uh, about a month ago, Robert Jervis, who wrote How Statesmen Think, his specialty was looking at countries as people and realizing that they have personalities, they have egos, they have fears, they have foibles. And you have to take that into account when you're dealing, you know, from a statesmanship approach that also applies to economics. Remember when we were growing up and there was the thrust of buying United States only products. And so people, there are a lot of people who would only buy something that wasn't either made in Japan or China, but in the United States. And uh, in fact, a flag was put on those products to encourage that. I've heard and read that the Chinese are starting to learn from that. Uh, you know, their dislike for Trump, their dislike for the Americans, their dislike for this these tariffs and these talks, they're actually shifting their buying patterns away from anything that the United States might make. And I think Jervis' point was excellent, where 
When you're talking about systems, don't divorce them from the people who make up the system. It's psychology as well. It is. And so we tend to think of bureaucracy somehow above the fray. And actually, it's not the case. You have people who take offense. You have biases which are either ingrained or can be created by circumstantial issues. There is an advisory in London, Brunswick, which just did a poll in China, and they were asking about consumption of U.S. imported goods into China. Fifty-six、mm-hmm. percent of the consumers polled said that they had recently avoided U.S. products. Sixty-eight percent said their opinion of U.S. firms was more negative. You know, so you've got Trump focusing on the trade numbers, and you know, scrutinized or the imports of Chinese goods into the United States. Well, the the other side of the equation is U.S. exports to China, with enough negative press. These potential customers in China, by the way, every Fortune 500 company in the world has wanted access. To China, why? Because if you can tap billions of consumers, it might be good for retail business. But again, with enough negative press, these potential customers they can go elsewhere for their consumption needs, for their wants. And I would feel bullied if I was from another country, and I was told unless we played by U.S. ball, by U.S. rules, we couldn't even transfer money using the SWIFT system. We couldn't. Do business with other countries based on the bullying of the United States. Now I'm a patriotic guy, but I'm not proud of the way we carry on international politics by limiting the way a person can do business outside of the United States. Well, there is also this issue of international law versus domestic law, and somehow we conflate. Our U.S. domestic law as having universal application,、mm-hmm. and so we feel that it's appropriate to fine international companies or even go after using the Treasury arm to go after countries that are not operating consistent and abiding by U.S. law. And the question is, wh- why would a citizen or a country independent of the United States? Be required to be subject to the laws of our land, and I'm not saying this as an out-and-out critique of the U.S., but as a way of asking the question:、um, Isn't it reasonable for people experiencing that pressure to have some resentment towards U.S. foreign policy? Well, what if the shoe was on the other foot? What if it was Russia, China, India, you name the country that was actually dictating the way the United States did business? I'd be treated as as an absurdity, right? So we see the anti-made in the USA trend there in China. Again, it's it's a growing trend. Last week, we threatened. Three Chinese banks with being cut off from the SWIFT transfer system if they continued to work with North Korea. So again, this is not a, a, a domicile nexus that includes the United States, but we're carrying out these threats and giving them daily fines if they continue to do business with North Korea. Well, who makes that decision? U.S. Attorney General, the Treasury Secretary. I mean, they can choose. To go from saber rattling to sort of taking out the financial saber, if you will, and cut these institutions off from U.S. markets, and further hinder global transfers via SWIFT. So this is where all of a sudden, because we have control or influence over the plumbing, capital plumbing of the world, we can use that control and influence over the capital plumbing to stop flows, redirect flows, et cetera, et cetera, and create a real problem for other countries, other companies, what have you. If somebody was controlling the plumbing in my house, I'd do a reroute. That's right. So you've got great fodder here for an anti-U.S. propaganda campaign, and I think that's what we'll continue to see with China, Europe. Has made a move to replace SWIFT. There's the reroute, and、yeah. this is a big deal because not only have we had trade and tariff talks with China, but this is kind of what brings the European group into the mix. You've got Instex, which is a workaround for European parties. To trade with Iran and to not be implicated by using U.S. controlled or influenced plumbing, so to say, and you know, for a moment, think about the risks within the financial markets if we begin to move in a retaliatory fashion against EU countries and companies that are using this Instex workaround,、mm-hmm. and you know, again, avoiding the U.S. Iranian sanctions. Look, we've already got manufacturing PMIs which are weak in Europe, and the countries that are the sponsors of Instex are Germany, France, the UK. Our big threat to all of them is loss of access to the U.S.-based financial and capital flow system. Right. 
And I think to some degree, when we start saber rattling this time around, they've got an alternative. You remember when we've read and we've discussed um, the structure of scientific revolutions. Right. Kuhn. And there really is never a shift in paradigm unless there is an alternative. So you can gripe and complain. You can come up with problems with the system, but nothing's ever done until there is a replacement there and you can step from one to the other. And I think that's really what what is interesting about this particular period in financial history is we're in essence forcing their hand. Mm -hmm. Not only are they creating the alternative to SWIFT, but we're actually damaging our power and influence in the world by forcing the issue with them on this particular point. Because as they create an alternative, it degrades our effectiveness. Think about how critical the Treasury Department has been to the implementation of our foreign policy objectives. And to lose that swift lever, that leverage over the control of, of capital flows, is a very big deal. Very a repeating big deal. theme over the last few months here on this commentary, not just with you and I, but with guests like Napier, is that this is not a trade war. Okay, this is a war of hegemony. Yeah, this okay. is a battle for hegemony. That's China has motion. gotten to the point where they are potentially the replacement superpower, and they're they're feeling their oats. And you've got other countries that are just saying, look, in aggregate, we have some power to wield ourselves. Sure. Um, maybe individually we can't, but standing together, kind of the Fareed Zakaria, rest of, rise of the rest type thing, um, we can have a unified voice. So capital flows and technology gates, that's if you think about that, those two areas, capital flows and the gates for how information flows, these are the arenas of conflict here at the front end of conflict. Hot wars, you can fight them. Maybe we don't see that. But what we have is the initial forays now based on capital and technology. And maybe it heats up. Maybe it heats up. As we suggested last week, you've got Iran, who is like that T-ball already set up on the T. Anytime we need to shift gears or change emphasis, or maybe Trump needs to, to throw uh, a little weight into the election process, he's going to swing hard at the ball that's already sitting Well, and today. remember, he's already shown restraint, and that's what you do first. <laughs> you show restraint on the first thing. Then whatever the second thing is, if you need to not show restraint, you are perfectly validated because you showed restraint the That's first right. time. That's exactly right. Let's go back, though. Before we finish up, I just think the unusualness of this period of time is hard to overstate as far as negative rates and extraordinarily low rates for high risk debt. OK, Portugal, Greece. Spain, countries that we were talking about just a few years ago, possibly failing, okay, completely defaulting on their debt. Now they're only having to pay just pennies on the dollar in interest on their debt because they know they have a backer. You showed me a chart here recently of an overlay of the price of gold and the quantities of debt trading in negative territory. I think Mark Faber yeah. um, had published that. And I, we haven't had Faber on the program for a while. It'd be fun we to need have him a conversation back with him. Yeah. But the Faber chart was interesting because you've got negative rates and the quantity of debt, which is trading at negative rates, set alongside in this picture gold and gold's performing very well. And in lockstep, I mean, the correlation is almost one to one, the increase in the quantity of, of negative yielding debt and the increase in the price and demand for gold is, is right the there. The fluctuations, you could use either chart to explain the other thing. It was, it was a fascinating, thank you for sharing that with me. Um, but the backdrop is these rates in a very variety of countries. The Greek 10 year, Treasury is is yielding 2.43%. This is a country that we thought was going to default six years ago. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and you could argue technically remains in default, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it doesn't matter because the ECB will do whatever it takes. Mario Draghi will do whatever it takes to paper over, like paper mache. Okay, whatever but Portugal and underneath. Spain. Portugal and Spain. The, I mean, there's a country. Oh, this that, is yeah. crazy. The, the, the Portuguese tenure is at 0.48. That's less than half a percent yield on 10-year paper. This is Portugal. Keep, right. keep in mind Portugal. The, the, the first letter of, of what acronym? Uh, PIGS. Remember that? From, <laughs> yeah, from the, the 2011-12 yep. time frame? Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain? Not too complimentary, Not, but actually, yeah, I mean, they were on the verge of extinction. And now, okay, just to remind the listener, what we're talking about is the interest that needs to be paid for the risk of default in that period of time. And what we're talking less than half of 1% from Portugal. Yeah, and the 10-year treasury here in the United States is kind of the benchmark for a lot of things. It's one of the numbers that informs our 30-year mortgage. And the importance of the 10-year treasury all over the world can't be understated. So 
Portugal is at 0.48, Italy's at 2.1, Spain's at 0.4, the German 10 year is negative 33 basis points, the French is negative just about five basis points, and then the UK, they're at positive 83 basis points, so just under 1%. The US 10 year is at 2. 2.01. And it's amazing because the benchmark rate right here in the United States, the U.S. 10-year Treasury, is yielding more than Portugal and Spain. We're running neck and neck with the Greeks and the Italian paper, right? So something has been lost, and, and this sounds like a broken record perhaps, but something has been lost in the information that is supposed to be conveyed from this interest rate. Well, remember limbo. How low can you go? I mean, at this point, you've got Germany, negative 33 basis points. It's hard to retire on negative interest. We need to keep an eye on one thing, Kevin. Here's we move towards June, July, and getting the numbers from home sales. U.S. mortgages are back today at 3.77% for the 30-year. Hmm. And again, that's tied to a low 10-year treasury as the U.S. 10-year has dropped, so has the 30-year mortgage. And yet the main numbers for new home sales sank 7.8%. So that's surprising. With rates contracting... You would think more homes would sell. But new home sales sank right. almost 8% in May. If June and July numbers of home sales don't improve considerably... Now you're talking about a factor which is likely to pressure the Fed to cut rates much more decisively July and, and into the fall. So this is really critical. Again, this backdrop, I can't help but think, this is weird stuff. This is weird. Well, okay, but a 30-year mortgage, why would you leave it at 30 years when it could be 50, 70, 80, 100? I wonder how low I could get my own <laughs> mortgage down to if I just talk to somebody about a 100-year loan. I'm going to be in Austria this fall, and one of the things that I think is interesting, the Austrians two years ago successfully sold 100-year bonds. And they sold them at a yield of 2%. <laughs> and, you know, you think, well, that's, that's not very smart. If you know the history of money or, or, or the history of interest rates, yeah. um, a lot can happen in a day, in a week, in a year. Well, that's assuming and, and inflation is in a century. That's can assuming you, inflation's going to stand at 2% for 100, 100 years, years in so Austria. Two years ago, that was then. The talk is now they're coming back to the market with another 100 year offering, 100 year paper, but the yield this time is 1%. <sighs> wow. Generous offer if you're in Europe, of course, but this is a great time to issue 100 year bonds. I guess the question before the audience today is who is the genius in that transaction? Who's the genius in that transaction? We live in, in interesting, perhaps curious times where even pigs fly. Dave, if I walked out of the room right now, out of the studio, and I saw pigs flying, all right, and that had never happened before, I could either invest in pig airlines and just say, well, I guess that's something that happens, or I could keep my feet firmly on the ground and not play. And, you know, I still go back to what you and your family have been doing, and I've been part of that for 32 years. But when things don't make sense, exit that room. Okay. And, you know, that's just, that's an old theory, actually, for people who are even in, uh, you know, security, guys who have security detail or what have you. They understand that something changes. Things stop making sense right before an event. And my thought would be keep your gold, keep your cash. Add to it, because things will make sense soon. The next several years are going to provide, I think, an immense opportunity for those who have their feet firmly on the ground. And, you know, this technical breakout above 1400 for gold is significant, not because it's the end of the line or the end of the story. I don't care, frankly, what gold's doing over the next month, two months, three months, but over the next two to three years, I think it's very significant. And that uh, Jeff Gundlach and, and Kyle Bass and, and Ray Dalio and, and Stanley Druckenmiller look at at the pigs flying and saying, this does not make sense. And I do think I want to own gold. I want to own real estate. I want to own real things. They're looking for things that do continue to make sense because they are real and basic in the context of things just getting crazy. Please don't ignore some of the quote unquote masters of the universe and in the fact that the world is getting topsy turvy, but there are still some very clear headed things that can be done. You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, and you can call us at 800-525-9556.
This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. 